Now, John he- John Healy, to me, is a very special human being. There's no doubt about that. And I was so fortunate by chance I met John. Um, when I first came here, uh, I was I was teaching at Maris Parramatta, but even when I was a little boy, I followed Parramatta uh, Eels in rugby league, and I still love them and still follow them. And uh, But when I came to Joey's, I, I used to... Um, take the boys out on Sundays in the college bus. We'd park behind old MC and um, we'd walk over to Cumberland Oval, the old Cumberland Oval, and uh, get a ticket and then we'd go and watch Parramatta play. I used to take a a milk crate from Carrot Canyon uh, because we'd get there late and I used to stand on the milk crate at the back of the the crowd on the hill and watch the game and it, it was... Oh, special days. But one year I got in there and um, there was an announcement. I'd only just arrived. And the boys had gone in and I've got my milk crate. And we walk up and I just got on up the top of the hill and stood on my milk crate and this announcement came over the PA. Would Brother Anthony from St Joseph's College please report to the microphone? And I thought, oh, no, they've only just arrived. What, what could they have done wrong, you know? Anyhow, I get down there and there was a lovely chap. He's since passed away. Uh, he was a legend of Parramatta, a bloke called Joe Joseph. He was, he was the, uh, all the fitness masseur and all that sort of stuff. He was a very large man. And um, I got to the gate and, and this Joe Joseph, who I'd only ever seen on TV, uh, he came to me and uh, said, uh, you brother Anthony? I said, yes. I said, what's happened? And he said, oh, look, um, just go and sit out there on that seat on the sideline and... Uh, uh, Peter Ferguson will be with you shortly. And Peter Ferguson was Justin's father. Justin was in year nine at the time. And uh, he was in my history class. But Peter was the doctor for Parramatta. And somehow he knew or he'd heard that I was taking boys to the ground. So he thought I'd give me a seat on the sideline. And anyhow, I went out there and I sat down. And this is a privilege. And just before the game started, Peter arrived. And uh, then as the game started, Terry Fernley and John Healy arrived. John Healy was the conditioner for Parramatta. And uh, he sat down and, and I sat next to him and that's where I met him. And I, I met him a number of times after that at Parramatta Games. And then one day I saw him in the corridor uh, upstairs. And I said, oh, John, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, my boy is starting. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. And Michael started that, that year. And then... A little bit after that, uh, they had the new parents' uh, barbecue. Um, you know, on the Saturday night, they have the function to welcome new parents. And John was there and he said, look, I would love to uh, be able to bring Parramatta out here to do some training, to use the facilities over at the park one Sunday. And I said, oh, John, that'd be lovely. We'd, we'd be happy for that. But as long as our boys could do it with them. And he said, oh, that'd be great. So uh, we, took, we took our rowers over because uh, it was, it was uh, February. The winter season hadn't started and, and we went over to the park and uh, he had people like Peter Sterling, Brett Kennedy, uh, Kenny, uh, Steve Eller, Mick Cronin, Ray Price. They were incre- Bob O'Reilly, Arthur Beetson. They were all in the team. And our boys were mixed up with these Parramatta legends and they had the first Healy session. Uh, it was with... John Healy, Parramatta Reels, and the Joey's first and second eight. And it was absolutely fantastic. And then Jeff Swagger was coaching the first at the time. And, uh, and that was 1980. And we didn't have a great year. And then the next year it was the centenary year. And I know Jimmy Gray and I were trying to convince Jim, uh, convince Jeff to get John Healy to condition the first. And uh, anyhow, he did. And of course, we won. And John, John conditioned the first 15 for 13 years. Uh, th- sorry, 30 years, not 13, 30 years. And during that time, there were 19 premierships. It's an extraordinary legacy. They talk about coaches. Uh, his, his legacy was unbelievable. And the messages he, he, he conveyed to the boys, uh, and still does, right, uh, were just amazing. Uh, I mean, I... There's so many things, in it. you don't remember them all when you're asked a question like that, but the one thing I used to always remember is he used to insist that they ran through the tape. 
Um, you know, he'd say, I want you to go from the um, 50 metre line to, to the try line, you know, at 75%. And, but what he'd want is that you ran 75% from halfway right through to the try line. That you didn't, as you got to the try line, start to slow down, that it became 60%. He was always, you go through the tape and then you change, that then you slow down. And, um, you know, running through the tape with John uh, at whatever was required uh, was the way it had to be. And he was fantastic. He, he also, he read body language really well. Um, sometimes he'd say, they need a bit more today or they need a bit less. You know, he, he didn't uh, have GPS monitors and heart rate monitors or anything else like that. But he was so skilled in his observation uh, of boys. And then the other wonderful thing he always did was just the little private conversations he might have had with a boy that gave him great belief in himself and confidence in his ability to be able to go out there and do his best. He was extraordinary. And he still is. Like even this year, uh, they asked me to talk to the first you know, on, on Saturday mornings, which is something we used to always do. And um, I'd prepare a presentation, and this year I had a wonderful presentation prepared because mainly it was John Healy, and we had a little video of him wishing them well. Um, and uh, and with him was Michael O'Grady, who was the captain of the first 15 in, uh, in uh, 1981, that centenary year, the first year John coached them. And John can't get to the games now, but he, um, uh, he he's in, in a retirement village uh, up at Byron Bay, and Michael lives in Byron Bay. Um, and Michael O'Grady goes and spends time with John every week. And uh, together they made this wonderful video of wishing the boys well and giving them points to concentrate on during the match. And uh, they're fantastic. He's been extraordinary, that man. Extraordinary. So... Dennis Fitzgerald came and said, listen, not quite that. He said, we've appointed Jack Gibson coach. We won't need you next year. And I said, well, that, no problem. I've, that, I've really enjoyed the five years I've been here, and I thank you. And I've made a commitment to Joey, so it's, it works out really well. So I had a fortnight to go, and I had four training sessions. And for two of them, for the first two, Jack Gibson came, never spoke to me, sat over there and watched everything. And then on the third night, he came to me, third night, that's right, the third one, he came to me and said, listen, he said, you've done a good job up here. He said, I'd like you to stay. He said, you'll have to work with uh, Mick Suter, my man, but I'd like you to stay. I said, oh, Jack, thank you very much. And I was genuine. I said, I regard that as a, as a real compliment, but I've made this commitment to go to Joey's and I've got to work to earn a living. I just can't, and I'm committed also to for classes and city tats. I said, I can't fit it all in. All in. Well, quick as a flash, he turned. He said, listen, you might learn something if you come up here with me. I said, Jack, I try and learn something every day of my, my life, but I can tell you now, I won't be back. He said, you think about it and I'll see you at the grand final. So I said, Jack, if I see you at the grand final, uh, I'll give you the same answer I'll give you now. Thanks, but no thanks. That, that was the only conversation I ever had with him. And he came to the grand final, he was in the room. If he was there, I made sure I was over there. I stayed well away from him. I would love to work with him, but I couldn't. Couldn't feel, I was doing city tats. I had earned a living. I had school bills, <laughs> food on the table, all those things. Well, uh, um, that's, I'm a classic example of the giver. Uh, who gets that much back, he gives one and he gets 10 back. I'm the classic example. Everybody thought I was I was giving, I was receiving. I learned so much uh, and I gained so much. It was such a wonderful place to work. Uh, I'm a great believer in team sport. I think you learn a lot. You're not meant to go through life solo. I don't mean you can't be single, but I mean, you don't live your life in isolation. Team sport's wonderful. You learn a lot there. It's not the only place, of course, but I think it's a great place to learn about yourself and to learn about others. Honestly, you'd pay money to get the opportunity to, to, to work in that environment. I was so lucky. I was so blessed. I only have the fondest memories of all the boys at Joey's. Naturally, uh, 
you favour some more than others. You you come into contact with some when they leave school, some you never see. But I just had general recollection, just wonderful, wonderful boys to work with. Best group of people I've ever worked with. No one ever said how many, how often. They just gave you the best and they gave you your best every time. Uh, they were just wonderful to work with. I was privileged and blessed to have the opportunity. As I say, doing something you like doing and getting all this back in return. It's the old story. You give one, you get 10 back. I was so lucky, so blessed. That's one of the one of the things I always remember about Joe's. They know how to, they know how to win. They know how to lose. Not that they lose too often, but when I watch television today, I see the way these cricketers, particularly sportsmen, carry on when they win. They celebrate amongst themselves before they go anywhere near the opposition. The first thing Joe's do is walk up to the opposition and shake their hand and thank them for the game. Then they get together and celebrate. There's no yahooing, jumping up in the air, having disregard or any res showing any respect for the people you, you've just played against. Quite the opposite. The first thing they do is walk up, shake their hands and thank them for the game. It, it, it stands out. It, it absolutely is an outstanding quality with Joey's. It's an outstanding quality for young men to learn and to know about. Because I tell you what, they won't get it from their heroes on the, on the TV and on the sporting scene. They go the other way. Well, when you're preparing for a game of for a game of football, the first thing you've got to do is make sure you've got the right attitude. Now, when you go out there and you run out there on the paddock, you don't go out there as a fullback or a sander or, or a group of, or even for that matter, as a group of schoolboys in a team. You go out there as a family. You care for one another. You love for one another. You're going to look after one another. You're going to make sacrifices for one another. Something good happens. It happens to all of you. Something bad happens, you all share it. You're a team, you're a family out there. That's the way to make sure your attitude's right. Get that right to begin with and you're off to a flying start. Well, there's been a lot of games that stick out in your memory, but I have to say if there were one, it goes back to, <coughs> pardon me, 1981, that first year against Scots College. They were leading, I think we'd scored two tries and they'd kicked three goals or something like that. They were leading by one point and it was coming towards the end of the game and Peter Tomkin kicked a full, <coughs> pardon me, kicked a full goal. Now there's all sorts, all sorts of stories told about what actually happened, but that is a game. Anyone who was there, I don't think will ever forget it. It was for me, just the most memorable game of football I can remember there was so much emotion uh, tied up, so much eh, so much depended on the result. We'd scored two tries, we deserved to win. They kicked goals, they didn't deserve to win, but it looked like they were going to win until Peter Tonkin kicked that field goal. At Joey's, you were taught to strive, certainly to strive to be the best you possibly can, but in so doing, you're no better than the next. Just you want to you want of the human part of the human race you're not special uh, not nowhere near I, I couldn't help but notice the big difference between a Joe boy and a certain other boy who I saw a lot of and I couldn't help but as I say the, the difference was was quite noticeable one felt certainly gifted superior the other one just felt now quite the opposite just felt I'm part of the human race what I do with my life, totally, it's just totally different, totally different atmosphere, totally different attitude altogether. Yeah, I love Joey's, I love the atmosphere of Joey's, I love Joey's, my sort of place, love it. <laughs>